go ahead and print. Okay. All right. I'll hand it over to you, Jeff. Um, thank you so much for having uh, for hosting us and sharing you, your wealth of information and experience with us. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invite and hi to everybody out there. I can't see any of you, but uh, uh, thanks for sharing your evening with, with me and hope I can tell you some things that uh, will be of interest to you. Um, so I titled my talk here, Current Understanding of Beech Leaf Disease, Biology, Spread, and Impacts. I think we're going to focus on... Um, the symptoms that you might see when you're out in the forest, because I gather that's what you guys are doing, kicking around the woods and looking at stuff and wondering what you're seeing and maybe thinking about ways you can help out, which greatly appreciate it. We can use all the help we can get. Um, but I really want to stress the current understanding part, because this is a very new disease. It's only been here since 2012 in Ohio and only arrived in this part of the world, um, meaning New Hampshire and Vermont, um, even much later than that, like 2023 in New Hampshire, I think even slightly later than that, uh, well, still 2023, but a bit, li bit li after we detected it here in New Hampshire in Vermont. Uh, I also want to mention a uh, co-author on this talk who contributed a lot of the slides and is a really solid colleague and is um, organizing a lot of the work around each leaf disease of Cameron McIntyre at the U.S. Forest Service. So I know from what I've heard already, lots of people have beech in their yards and in their forests and are very well familiar with this tree. It's an iconic tree in this part of the world and in the Northeast, it's a component of 17 different forest types and um, probably most associated with sugar maple in our area, but a, in its glory, a big, beautiful, smooth bark tree uh, produces this biannual, approximately biannual nut crop that's incredibly important to wildlife. Um, of course, it suffers from a few different problems, and one of them we'll talk about today at some length, um, but the range of beech is actually quite broad. It's uh, all throughout the east, uh, most dominant in the sort of uh, in the northeastern part, but but really um, all throughout the range that you see there. So it's widespread and, and abundant, has high ecological value. Uh, it's prolific regeneration uh, is also sort of a dominant feature of this species, so it produces um, these seed crops that I said are about every two years, give or take, um, and really can lead to just a blanket, a flush of seedlings on the ground. Uh, but it also produces by root sprouts, uh, reproduces by root sprouts. So that's an, another feature of the species that helps it to uh, probably initially that evolved as a as, as a way to um, re-sprout after fire. Um, but uh, it really defines the ecology of the species in terms of its dominance, uh, especially in the understory. Um, sometimes to the uh, detriment of the recruitment of other species that we might actually prefer in some cases like sugar maple. So many people know that this tree is already highly impacted by beech bark disease. Beech bark disease is something that I've studied for, for years now, actually was the subject of my PhD at Dartmouth College. So I know quite a bit about that, spe uh, that species complex, uh, disease complex, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about it uh, since we're focusing on beech leaf disease, the new emerging emerging threat. Uh, but if anyone has any questions about beech bark disease, I'm happy to happy to take those questions. So, um, well, one slide on beech bark disease, I guess. So, beech bark disease has been part of our forest broadly speaking since 1890. Um, the the scale insect was introduced into Halifax, Nova Scotia in, in 1890. Uh, and that's that's a, the felted beech scale that you might see forming those white uh, little flecks or sometimes mats on the on the bowl of, of beech trees. Uh, that sort of unlocks the phloem resources, the the inner bark resources to two native fungi in, in the same genus, the genus Neonectria, um, and leads to that kind of cankering look, which makes the trees quite unattractive, I guess, to look at and not very valuable except for firewood. Um, but uh, we still have a lot of smooth bark trees out there. Um, trees that are infected can can actually live for quite some time, decades even in the aftermath forest. There tends to be a wave of high, high mortality when beech bark disease first rolls through a stand, followed by sort of a, a stage where um, beech trees actually tolerate the disease quite well. Um, they do become a little bit higher, uh, more likely to, to be, come to things like um, wind throw and snap. Um, so there, there, there are there is higher elevated uh, there is elevated mortality associated with beech bark disease, but um, it's in the presence of this disease, the tree is actually doing fine. And due to this prolific root sprouting and seedling production um, regeneration, the tree is actually able to compensate for the lost adult trees. It sort of shifted its size and age structure to a 
smaller, denser forests, but it's still present in, in many of our forests. So these thickets have been the subject of a lot of frustration for foresters because uh, they do actually inhibit understory, understory diversity, both vegetation diversity and uh, and other kinds of diversity like um, well, herbaceous diversity and arthropods are, have been shown to be uh, less, uh, show reduced species richness under these thickets. Um, and this is can be a consequence of beech bark disease, but it's also a co consequence of just you know harvesting and and all kinds of forest disturbance. It's just a property of the tree species. Um, the the beech mast is incredibly important to a lot of our wildlife. So it's forty two species of, of birds feed on um, on beech seeds. Bear actually depend on beech seeds during the fall as a late fall fr protein source. In fact, in uh, in Sort of failed mast years where there where there aren't aren't sufficient uh, beech seeds available, the female bears will actually resorb their embryos and, and not give birth to next year. So they depend a lot on the, on this uh, on this this protein source, especially in the northern parts of the range where where there's no oak to take to to provide other uh, nuts. And yeah, so. Um, Beach bark disease notwithstanding, we have a new problem in our forest, and that's beech leaf disease. And maybe you've seen a picture like this before, but uh, I'll, I'll go into the details of this characteristic banding and what causes it. But, but um, this was uh, noticed in Ohio in about 2012, um, and it was a complete mystery. I'll, I'll go into that in just a bit. But um, so when we talk about beech leaf disease, we're actually talking about um, symptoms that can show up on a number of different hosts. So it's so far limited to beach, but not just American beach. So of course we have plenty of European beach uh, and even Oriental and Chinese beach planted in our, not necessarily forest, but um, in our gardens and uh, botanical gardens. And all three of those species are susceptible to beach leaf disease. We see symptoms, um, but what we're pr primarily concerned about of course is American beach because that's one of our uh, important forest species. So, these are the symptoms that started showing up uh, and they range from very, you know, light, barely noticeable symptoms to really heavy symptoms, but uh, on um, light symptoms are characterized by this kind of um, this, this yellowing of, of the intervenal um, areas of the leaf. So discolored banding between these lateral veins um, and it can be variable in terms of the number of these bands that you see, but usually it's not the whole leaf. It's usually less than half of the leaf surface area that's affected in this, in, in this light symptom category. And the leaves can be normal sized and you know effectively functional, although they do exhibit reduced photosynth photosynthetic capacity. Um, then uh, the best way to see this disease in the forest in the summer or spring and summer anyway, is to look from below with, uh, if the leaves are backlit, this, this banding is very, very obvious. You can see that, that even with a senescent leaf, you can see this, this, this clear banding. And what this banding is, is, um, is very much thickened um, tissue that's uh, a consequence of the feeding of a nematode that we're going to get into in just a minute. But um, when symptoms get heavier, um, we, we see actually kind of leaves curling and uh, showing evidence of necrosis. So this, uh, well, necrosis, just the leaves dying back, curled and shriveled edges, um, thick and le leathery uh, texture. Um, so oops, uh, so the, um, the bands themselves are very much thickened and leathery. And when it takes over the whole leaf like that, the whole leaf has that feeling. Uh, so it's important to recognize that are, there are a lot of things out there that, that can be mistaken for beech leaf disease. If you're looking hard for something, you tend to want to find it. Um, but I wanted to go over a few of the things that could be easily mistaken for um, for beech leaf disease so that um, to minimize false reports, I guess, and to keep um, concern to a minimum where it's not warranted, although it's spreading quite rapidly. Um, so the, the woolly be beech aphid it's, um, is pretty common in our forest. It's also an, a non-native species, but it's has relatively minimal impacts on, on tree growth and survival. Very minimal, I'd say. Uh, it can cause this kind of leaf rolling. Um, you may have seen, if you've looked carefully, um, there's a, a mite species, or, or actually a suite of species that produces these kinds of very surface layer galls. I have another picture or two on the next page, but uh, they can be either red or yellow or this kind of cream color. 
but this is actually um, modified leaf, leaf tissue in which um, immature mites um, reproduce and, and, and feed. Uh, of course, we have frost damage. I don't know what it was like in, in Vermont last year, but um, we had a, a very late frost in, uh, I guess it might have been even early May, late April, early May, after, after the leaves had, had come out and it killed quite a lot of our uh, beech leaves and oak leaves. And we got many, many calls that, thinking that the forest was dying. Uh, when it was just a late frost and, and and our trees are pretty robust to these late frost events they can they can put out a second flush of leaves and wind up looking relatively normal and um, capture recapture most of their photosynthetic capacity uh, and then of course nutrient deficiency can actually produce kind of a waxy and um, look to these leaves um, with a yellow um, or sort of chlorosis around the around the edges so just a couple more pictures of these um, uh, I, I refer to them as areophyid mites. I think that it's called arenium mites is a common name, but they can produce these galls of different colors you see here. And even these kind of finger-like structures, this is very likely a different species causing that. Here's a, a scanning electron micrograph, a colorized scan, scanning electron micrograph of a mite, um, a rust mite that would be responsible for something like this. But this is very, very common. Again, doesn't really hurt the, the, uh, the tree and it's definitely not associated with beech leaf disease. Uh, and just another suite of pictures about um, the woolly beech aphid you can produce this kind of leaf curling. If you were to unravel that leaf, you might find little colonies of these um, furry aphids, this, these uh, covered in these exudates, sugary, sugary exudates that the, um, that the that are produced by the, through the exo exoskeleton of the aphids. And they can become quite abundant. You see here, uh, this is European beech. It really has this strong leaf curling. Uh, again, not associated with beech leaf disease. So symptoms vary across time as well. So if we look in the spring, we see range from asymptomatic leaves to this, this banding to, to crinkling to this these aborted buds. Um, that's one of the major um, impacts of beech leaf disease. So we see some, some leaves produced, so that emerge leaf out from the buds and uh, are infected and, be, and start to produce this banding and necrosis. And other buds that had been infected this fall before that harbored a population of, of nematodes over the winter that just won't, um, won't open up at all. So the bud is aborted. And what that leads to is what we call a non-foliated situation. So it's not really defoliation because there was never any foliage to begin with, but it just didn't produce leaves that season. Um, so in the early spring, when, when you sh would be expecting to see lots and lots of beach flush, you basically see none. Uh, and then in, in, in that situation, you can get a second flush. So there are still um, buds that can produce a second flush of, of leaves. So you might get some recovery uh, at both the stand and the individual tree level. Um, but usually the, the leaves that are produced as second flush are kind of smaller and um, yeah, not as productive. And some will ultimately, I guess those wouldn't likely to be, would be unlikely to become infected, but there are still will be leaves that did actually leaf out that will become infected and or show symptoms of infection and produce this kind of banding and necrosis and even early defoliation. Um, so unfortunately, what we see is, you know, this non-foliated situation and then also secondary defoliation um, as in highly infested leaves are dropped by the tree. So the canopy begins to really kind of deteriorate. Um, so you, you see some clear sky through a, what would otherwise be a dense beach canopy. Here, here in the middle, you have, uh, you know, quite a lot of beach um, regeneration sap seedlings and saplings that have lost their leaves and you know it, it's it's starkly different than you would expect uh to feel in terms of the lighter environment uh in, in these highly infested stands relative to uninfested stands so if you're in a highly infested stand you're you're, you're likely to know it um but many stands are sort of intermediate these are dramatic examples so again um the best way to find this thing is to look up really um, pick pick a bright day or uh, even a cloudy day as long as the sun's shining through and look through the leaves and if you see this this kind of banding that is a very strong uh, indication that that's a beech leaf disease uh, infected tree 
Okay, so um, I wanted to go over the symptoms first, um, but of course, another very important component of this question uh, of what's infecting our forests is what causes beech leaf disease. So this was a bit of a mystery at the outset. So I've already hinted that this is a, a, a nematode, but um, at the plant pathologists who were the first to, to have samples sent to them and try to figure out what this thing is, immediately started thinking about things like uh, fungal infection or bacterial pathogens or phytoplasmas, maybe you've heard of these things or phytoplasmas anyway, um, that are common, commonly causing these kinds of symptoms on, on forest trees. Uh, but they couldn't find anything out of the ordinary really. Uh, they thought maybe it was viral, uh, maybe some some mites were impacting these uh, leaf tissue for, somehow, um, but really nobody had thought of a, a nematode because uh, nematodes typically don't cause this kind of damage. We, we have lots of uh, root feeding nematodes that can damage our vegetable plants and, uh, and are associated with tree roots as well. Uh, but foliar nematodes, uh, especially defoliating foliar nematodes are really kind of unheard of. So uh, it took a while for scientists to figure out um, what was actually causing this. This was not work that I was involved with. I was still overseas at this time, um, but uh, th they ultimately got a, a hit on a, a nematode causal agent and here's a, an electron micro, again, a colorized uh, scanning electron micrograph of a, of a nematode within a beech leaf. So these tiny worms and these round worms, um, you know, less than a millimeter long, uh, can be just in absolute thousands within these infected leaves. And uh, it was suspected that they were the causal agent. And um, if you look at them closer, they have actual structures that can be seen, but they're really, really tiny. Um, uh, you can cut leaves and that are infested and put them in a petri dish with some deionized water, um, mostly so that there's no chlorine in the in the water that would kill the nematode. Um, and they will kind of squiggle their way out. Uh, this used to be a video, but I sort of screenshot it uh, for simplicity. But these tiny little uh, thread-like worms are. Uh, are the nematode, and, and it has a name now. Um, it's called Litolenchus crenati, uh, and it's subspecies Mechanii. Um, so they're relatively contemporaneously, or the, just about the same time in Japan, they were finding some symptom symptoms similar to what we're seeing in, in North America on Japanese beach in in Japan, and they found a species Litolenchus crenati that they um, compared and decided was actually distinct from the species that we have. So we, we suspect that the origin of this nematode is somewhere in Asia uh, because, well, because of the discovery of that re closely related uh, sister species in Japan, but um, because we don't know where else it could have come from, I guess, but that's, that's yet to be confirmed. And here you see the males and the females. And if you're a nematologist, these actually look starkly different to you. They look a, a lot of, a lot alike to me. Uh, but you can tell the juveniles and the uh, and these little tiny eggs that they lay uh, in the in in the in the bud tissue especially. So let's see. Um, this is Bear Brook State Park, the sort of ground zero for where we found the nematode or beech leaf disease symptoms first in in New Hampshire, and uh, really can tell the disease stand from the healthy stand. And this was uh, just just a year ago now, or or not even. Um, and already fairly significant damage being um, witnessed. So I mentioned that the beech leaf nematode overwinters and, and, and reproduces in the beech bud. So here you can see uh, uh, bud scales stripped from a, of an a infected, uh, infested uh, beech bud and as a function of how many how, how impacted the bud is, the number of nematodes inside goes up dramatically. So that's pretty strong evidence that there's a causal agent here. Um, the other thing that was done is uh, what's called Koch postulates, where they um, scientists were able to extract the nematode and um, then apply it back to be healthy beech leaves in a in a solution just spraying it on the surface of the leaves and onto buds. And then they were able, they were able to recapitulate uh, the symptoms. So 
pretty strong evidence that there was a nematode cause. Um, there is still some question in the literature and among the scientific community as to whether there are other things associated with the nematode and the disease that might be important, like different bacteria that can either live inside or alongside uh, nematodes that might be producing toxins that are causing some of these symptoms. Um, but we're still kind of we're still working on uh, on those th those associations. Uh, I'll speak about that just a little bit later. So when you when you crush a really highly infested bud, uh, th there can be thousands and thousands of nematodes inside. So they're really really tiny um, and doing lots of damage. So here's a newly infected bud scale, and uh, you can actually look, find the nematode eggs um, if you look carefully enough. Uh, this is Paolo Vieira's work at the USDA um, ARS, uh, who does really excellent work with um, very high power microscopy. So he, this is also a paper by Paolo um, looking at a cross section of a developing, or I guess a dormant um, beach, win, oh, a beach bud, a winter bud. So here you can see the new, new stem tissue. And this is actually what the leaves look like when they're all folded up. Uh, over the winter before they've emerged, and you can see the the main the primary vein, and then the lateral veins in this particular cross section, and then in infected buds you can see that there's already been damage to the leaves even prior to them emerging from the bud. So here, uh, if you look, you can actually you can find evidence of of nematodes and and nematode eggs. You can also see that um, the, the cell structure is getting all messed up. There's extra cell layers in this infected part of the, the leaf relative to the, the healthy part. And um, there's, there's clear evidence of damage there. So that's, um, yeah, so here's a, another picture. This is a cross section of, a, of an infected leaf. Uh, so here in the uninfected leaf, you have nice, um, what we call um, mesophyll uh, um, tissue and, um, you know, areas, that, well, anyway, intact structure of the leaf. In the presence of the nematode, though, you get extra cell layers. So it's, uh, beach leaves are supposed to have five to six cell layers, but here you can see it's just a mess. The, the feeding of the nematode and possibly uh, any microbial associates that might be um, along for the ride or, or driving some of these dynamics are um, causing this, this sort of disruption of the cellular structure of, of the leaf itself inside these bands. So might not surprise you, but uh, Cameron McIntyre did some work with um, measuring photosynthesis using this ERGA machine here um, and showed pretty clearly that these crinkled leaves, the highly infested leaves are, uh, pretty, are photosynthesizing much less um, as a function of light intensity than the banded that are a little less infested and the of course versus the asymptomatic. So there's a you know more than a 50 more than a 50% loss in photosynthetic capacity in the highly infested leaves, which shouldn't be the surprise if you look at them. They just they look terrible and like they they really aren't that functional, but they are actually photosynthesizing, which is um I guess good, but not nearly as much as they would be. Um it's, I'm not really showing these graphs, but um the Symptomatic leaves are also um, less efficient in terms of their water use, and um, and there was a relationship with nitrogen as well. So one of the most obvious things to do when you have a new pest or pathogen in the forest is to survey for it, find out where it is. And so over time, um, well, this really represents um, the, the spread of the nematode. So at first, it was seemed like it was relatively um, localized in the Ohio, Lake County, Ohio, where it was introduced in 2000, 2012, or we assume it was introduced, that's where it was first detected. Um, but now it's already spread to 15 states uh, and, and to Ontario, Canada, uh, and so really spreading very quickly. Um, the transmission vector, so how it's getting around, is really not well known. So this is, this is through um, 2020. I have a more recent map uh, coming up, but you can see that this is uh, this thing's moving quickly. Um, sorry for the spelling error there, um, but yeah, the transmission vector is important. So how is it getting from tree to tree and from stand to stand? You know, some 
some invasive pests and pathogens depend on human movement. It doesn't seem, that based on the pattern of spread, it seems very much too quick for it to be um, driven primarily by human movement. Uh, it's pretty likely that it's moving on the wind. It may be carried by mites. There's been some interesting studies showing that um, it's at least found on the surface of mites and maybe uh, also predatory mites that could move it around. It's able to pass through the gut of birds. Um, finches and other birds that overwinter in our forests actually feed on winter buds. And they can theoretically, well, they, they it's been shown if you feed a bird, uh, chickadees and titmice in this particular study, um, infected buds that the nematode can pass through the gut and survive. So that, that is a uh, potential vector that could get this thing around quite quickly. Um, but yeah, okay, so from, oops, yeah, so sorry. From 2020 to 2021 to 2022 to 2023, rather, um, you can see massive spread. And so some of this can be attributed to us now looking for it, but it really is um, spreading quite quickly. And, and we can see places where it's shown up that it, it that we surveyed for that it clearly wasn't um, just recently. And I don't think this map shows that it's now in the uh, southern county of uh, Vermont, but it is, unfortunately. Um, oh, there it does in December, 2023. So um, it's important to recognize that just because a county is infested, it doesn't actually mean that every stand or every town within that county is, is also infested. So here, if you look, um, you know, if you look at New Hampshire, all of the Southern part of the state is infested, but there are quite a number of towns that, um, that have not yet reported this, this, uh, this pest, but um, it, it is spreading quite quickly. So it's, it's, it's getting around and it may well saturate our forests uh, to some degree, you know, within just a few years, but um, it's also quite likely that you could go out now and, and not find it at all. So it's important to recognize that anywhere you are. So I mentioned monitoring. The, the Forest Service is uh, partnered with all the Northeastern states and um, is really putting for, forth a strong effort to try to map and understand the impacts of this disease. So uh, these are long-term monitoring plots in, in, in blue here. And um, you can see the counties where beach leaf disease is present. Each one of these plots um, represents, um, well, there are 150 of them total. They're, they're 10th acre fixed area plots, so just very standard forestry technique for, for measuring um, trees and, and forest impacts. And they're remeasured annually, again, by a suite of partners, which are incredibly helpful to understanding the development of this disease. So, uh, anytime you study uh, um, a phenomenon across this kind of um, heterogeneous landscape, you're going to get variation in elevation, and slope, and aspect, and stocking density, and disease severity, and, and crown health. So these are all things that we're measuring. You know, we meet being the Forest Service and the and the state partners, really. But uh, data that are be being produced are going to be hugely valuable to understanding uh, what are the drivers of disease severity, and are there are there certain forest types that are more likely to be infested, how um, does beach density affect um, overall intensity of this disease, and so on and so forth. So, of course, it's it's important to recognize that we now have two invasive pests you know, that are really impactful or potentially impactful in our forest, beach bark disease and, as, and beach leaf disease, and they're kind of moving in these opposite gradients. So I mentioned before that beach bark disease is from Halifax, Nova Scotia, kind of slowly moving to the south and west, it's jumped a couple of times to Michigan uh, and down to West Virginia, but generally speaking, this is the direction of movement of that disease. And now we have beech leaf disease spreading from Ohio, sort of north towards, um, well, in the, north, to, to the northeast. And so we're, we're, there are many stands that are already co-infected with both, both beech leaf disease and beech bark disease. Um, and it's a really important question, what's going to happen when those two diseases uh, encounter one another, I guess, or, or co-occur in, in the field. So beech bark disease affects the bowl of the tree, and beech leaf disease affects the leaves, so they're not likely to interact, direct, interact directly. Um, but whether trees will be able to weather the storm of both pathogens, uh, broadly speaking, um, or not, is, is a big question. So. There has been some preliminary work on this, um, about 600 trees that were classified as un no disease, neither beach bark disease nor 
um, nor beach leaf disease. And the metric here is crown density. So we can measure percentage, um, well, crown density, how many leaves there are when you look up above, basically it's a standardized metric. So um, in the presence of beach bark disease only, you get a reduction in crown density relative to the undiseased state of about 14%. Um, it's about 17% where beech leaf disease is present by itself, but where you get both, the reduction is uh, 27%. So it seems like there's some synergy among these two diseases that's de more detrimental to the um, to the uh, trees than, than, well, I guess it's not quite additive, but if it were additive, it would be 14 plus, plus 17. So it's, it's um, but there, there's, there are detrimental effects of being co-infected by these two um, exotic diseases. And then um, if you look at high severity beach bark disease, um, then you have a really much stronger uh, effects of uh, both beach, like, beach leaf disease and beach bark disease. So in low severity beach bark disease, um, you get about 80% crown density. It goes down to 50% in, in high, high severity uh, beach bark disease trees in the presence of beach, beach leaf disease. So um, I, I know that some of your forests are highly infected with uh, beach bark disease. So unfortunately, that's probably a major risk factor for them. So there, there's been a major scramble to sort of try to figure out what to do, uh, of course, and we don't have a ton of answers right now. Uh, you know, there's, it's difficult to imagine effective biological control, microbial control is a possibility, um, finding some endoph endophytic fungi that limit this, the growth or spread of beach leaf disease is a possibility, uh, but it's, it's a pretty tough one. Um, there has been some success with potassium fertilization. So this uh, polyphosphate 30, and I uh, should mention that the Forest Service for sure, and I don't, uh, and, uh, nor do I um, endorse these products because I don't, I haven't studied them specifically, but um, Dan Herms and this group um, showed pr pretty convincingly that uh, phosphonate soil treatments can actually limit the uh, growth of the, or the, the, the population growth of the nematode and lead to beech tree recovery and lower nematode densities. So that's one possibility we could consider. Of course, that's not going to work on a forest scale, right? If you have a particular tree in your yard that you really want to protect, you might consider this product, um, uh, sorry, potassium fertilization. But yeah, well, it, it, as a as a forest protection um, approach, it's really not feasible. There are some chemical controls. Uh, this broad form. Um, there are a lot of nematicides out there. This one's applied as a foliar spray um, under you know, different recommendations and uh, has been shown to result in beech leaf disease symptom recovery and lower densities in, in the buds. Um, and then we have a number of research projects. Um, one of the first one of which this one is the one that I'm most involved with. This is Patrick Lemus, a master's student in my lab. Uh, and we are actually look, looking at using um, dendrochronology, so um, tree ring analysis, in order to try to understand how uh, beech leaf disease se severity and the co-occurrence between beech leaf disease and beech bark disease is affecting tree growth, so radial growth in increment or uh, over time. So we can we can take cores from trees from across the range of the of the current infestation. So Patrick, this summer, will be going out to Ohio and traveling through many of the infested states across that sort of temporal gradient of of infection, and trying to tease apart how um, growth is affected over time since infestation with beech leaf disease. So uh, that you know, one thing we don't really know is how many trees will die as a consequence of this tree of this disease of beech leaf disease so we've um we've there've been reports of saplings dying and a few adult trees but most trees are able to sort of carry on uh, looking not very healthy but we haven't had a, uh reports of widespread mortality yet um and hopefully that won't happen but uh understanding how growth losses can be sustained over time and how that affects carbon balance and, and survival of trees is, is an important question. So that's, that's one way we're approaching this particular uh, 
problem. Uh, then, of course, understanding how the how this nematode is moving around. So there's a Forest Service International Programs uh, project looking at vectors associated with long and long distance and local dispersal. So looking at uh, movement of nematodes by birds and by arthropods and um, you know, plant tissues and wind. And then, of course, you know the question of whether it can move is uh, is important, but it has to be movement of viable. Uh, organisms, so eggs or, or juveniles or adults that, that move and can infect other trees. So uh, there's also always the possibility that we're moving it ourselves. So the movement of nursery trees or firewood, mulch, lumber. Um, so this group here, Sharon Reed and a, and a couple of others are, are heading up that effort. And then um, there's studies going on about the nematode itself. So this is Bob Mara and this is Paolo Vieira and, and, and others that are um, very much involved in trying to understand the population structure and the origin of this nematode. So uh, getting material from Japan and other parts of Asia and even going to Japan and Asia to try to compare the genetic diversity of uh, this is Little Lenchus crenati mechanii and Little Lenchus crenati crenati, which is the, the sister species in Japan, to try to understand how, um, how this thing has got here and how it's potentially moving around and, and whether it's all moving around elsewhere in the world um, using these kind of genomic techniques to understand variability and, um, and possibly find targets for control. So I wanted to leave you guys with some things that maybe you could do if, if you feel motivated to, to help out uh, with, with uh, understanding and, and hopefully eventually controlling this uh, this massive problem in our forest, one uh, one thing is to report, of course. So uh, there are state websites for each of the nor northeastern states, with the exception of Connecticut. I just put the website for uh, Connecticut Agricultural Station. I couldn't find a reporting site, but this is these are actually links for to um, beech leaf disease specific reporting sites for all the states. So. Um, if you're in Vermont, you can click on Vermont Invasives, which I think you know all about, uh, and report uh, a new infestation if, if you find one. Um, hopefully, the, the pictures I've given you help you to discern which is beech leaf disease or maybe not. Um, in terms of, you know, reporting areas that, have, that are already reported, you know, it, it doesn't hurt, I guess. But, you know, if you kind of, if you know you're in a place where beech leaf disease has already been reported, I suppose it's not as necessary. Um, but one thing um, that would actually be really helpful um, is to help us to find and and and, uh, and map trees that look like they may have been killed by beech leaf disease. So it's of course always difficult to know what killed a tree. But if you see an area that's highly infested with beech leaf disease and there's clear evidence of trees uh, dying, you know, um, not just be not just having lost their leaves, but actually uh, you know, well, exhibiting dying, um, then we we would like to know about that. So, I'd very much like to receive emails from anybody who who finds tree uh, uh, evidence of uh, beech leaf disease mortality. Uh, Cameron Mac McIntyre also would be interested. You know, we kind of work together, so it doesn't matter who you email. But um, if if you do find areas of of tree kill uh, as a co what you deem to be a consequence of beech leaf disease, that would be very useful to us to to understand where this is happening. Like I said, it hasn't really occurred to date, but it's definitely a possibility. It, it has occurred in saplings and in a few large trees, but it's not widespread at this moment. And then I wanted to put in a plug uh, to, oops, that's uh, it's not supposed to look like that, um, to watch out for one other guy who is sort of on our doorstep. This is the beech leaf, leaf mining weevil, Orchestes fagi, and this critter, as cute as he is, is uh, up in um, eastern Canada and um, causing quite a lot of damage there. This this is a leaf where the, the larvae fed in and produced these kind of small holes. I unfortunately, covered my other picture at the last minute here, but it's, it's a leaf miner, so the larvae live within the leaf tissue themselves and kind of you get this necrosis along the outside. This could be mistaken for beech leaf disease, I suppose, although it does look different. Uh, but if you see something that looks like this, I would be interested to know it because we are worried that this uh, weevil could be introduced from Canada, uh, you know, any day now, really. Um, it's unfortunately, there's no regulations against movement of beach across the Canadian-US border because 
Well, there just isn't. Uh, it's, this is not a quarantine pest at the moment. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of watching out for that too. Okay, so um, thanks very much for listening. That's that's all I have for you for just now. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I think what's um, there's just so much to learn. <laughs> and I'm really excited about all the research projects that you have lined out from everything from vectors to um, to how this pest actually survives. So um, in the chat, I put a several links as, as Jeff was talking, I put a link to um, the current uh, beech leaf disease uh, distribution map that we have currently in Vermont. It's in two towns that we've identified. Um, and that was in the fall of 2023 is in Demerston and Vernon. Um, and I believe one of those reports had actually come through vtinvasives.org. So that um, reporting website is incredibly, incredibly important. You just upload a picture and it goes directly to several people's emails and we can facilitate a very quick response, whether that's an insight in on site person in person visit um, or being able to get more information. So it has been a really great tool. It was also the first tool that we were able to identify emerald ash borer. So um, we highly recommend using the report it. I know it kind of feels weird to send a picture to a form and you think no one's getting it, but it comes to us and <laughs> we respond to all, all things really quickly. So um, so thank you so much, Jeff, and please uh, take your time to put your questions in the chat. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question to Jeff directly, please feel free to do so. I see David has um, shared his camera. David, do you, would you like to start us off with a question? Well, I, I highly suspect the answer is uh, we don't know, but uh, you mentioned that with beech bark disease, it goes through these phases where there's sort of a you know, a, a, an attack phase, a first phase, which has heavy die off. And then there's, I forget what you called it, but maybe an accommodation phase where, um, you know, the survivors show some resistance um, is, I, I think it's probably too early to know if that's going to happen with beech uh, leaf disease. And how, you know, how do you determine how do you monitor that for the life life cycle of these to see long term how how these things are going to affect a population of trees in general? Right. So that, that's a very good question, and you're you're absolutely right that the answer is I don't know, unfortunately. I mean, I would say generally speaking, so we we call um, in beach in the beech bark disease literature, it's called the the sort of the the well the advancing front, then the killing front, and then the um, and then the aftermath for us. So the advancing front is where you just have the scale insect that's spread into a new stand and is really whitewashing the trees. And uh, and then you get the fungi that come in and that's really where trees start to die. And then you get uh, crashes in the populations of both the scale insect and the fungi and, um, and very much reduced mortality. And that's what we call the aftermath for us. So I guess there's the only way we can know that, that, would, that that's going to happen is because it's been here for a hundred and some 130 some years. And so we have the benefit of hindsight to be able to say that this is the pattern that we see time and time again. I will say that that pattern does occur with quite a number of novel pests and pathogens. So they look really terrible when they first arrive and then the impacts kind of mitigated over time. So I think there's some hope that we can uh, expect that the worst of what we see now might not be uh, something that's gonna be sustained for, for de decades and decades. You know, even emerald ash borer kind of hit, peaks in abundance and then crashes. Unfortunately, the the endemic equilibrium, we might say, of how many ash we'll have on our landscape is probably not that many ash. So one way you can come to an equilibrium is just to lose the species. Of course, we ho hope that doesn't happen. That's what happened with chestnut blight. Um, I have hope for beech. It's a diverse wind-pollinated species, lots of genetic diversity. Lots of tolerance. It's tough. It produces these, you know, abundant regeneration. So, I, I think I don't. I'm not counting out the species just yet. Um, but it's difficult to know what the trajectory will be uh, without, like, having at least 20, 30 years behind us. But if if things start to mitigate in Ohio and other places where it's been for 11 years, then we we might start to to make that hypothesis a bit stronger. But yeah, th good question. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa, you're next. Hi. Um, I just had a question about um, vectors, I guess. If you're in a stand that is impacted and you're walking on defoliated leaves that are full of nematodes, do you need to be concerned about boot to soil transmission or is that unlikely because it's the buds that are Well, so impacted? that's a good question. So um, one thing I didn't mention and I probably should have, you, so people probably are familiar with the beech as being a marquescent species. Maybe you don't know the word, maybe you do, but how it retains its leaves over winter, uh, especially in the saplings. And so if you go and you, you can actually find banded leaves in a beech leaf disease infested stand uh, and, and sample even just the leaves over winter and there are viable nematodes in there. But you can also look in the, in the leaf litter and find viable neg uh, nematodes in the leaf litter. Whether those ultimately get back into the tree or if those are kind of doomed to die in the soil, we don't actually know. I don't know what the pathway exactly is for them, for nematodes to get from the soil back to the leaves. Um, but, you know, birds can picking things up and moving things around or arthropods. So, um, but the question is about your boots. And that's a really good question. We, um, my lab and the Forest Service folks do bleach our boots after being in a, an infested stand. Um, so I just keep a little, little, bottle bleach in my truck and, you know, mix it with some water and dip my boots in there for, you know, half a minute. And um, that should take care of the nematodes. My the unfortunate reality is, you know, people are moving around all the time, their dogs. And, you know, I don't think that that researcher boots are a major, it's probably a drop in the, in the ocean, but, but if you want to be extra careful that you could definitely bleach, bleach your boots. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead and use the chat or if you'd like to raise your hand or unmute, still have some time for more questions. I, one question just clarifying is uh, the there hasn't been widespread mortality of beach. Is that is that just in the Northeast or what are you, what are they seeing out in Ohio? So, um, I think the, the most reports of trees dying putatively from beech leaf disease, of course, trees can die anyway, and there can be other stressors and including beech, beech bark disease that can contribute. But um, the, the most reports of beech leaf disease mortality is in New York for some reason. I, I don't exactly know why, um, but it seems like most of the trees that have been monitored are, are kind of hanging on there. So um, what we're really worried about is this growth loss. So if, if trees, you know, abort their buds in in the late winter and just never foliate in the first place. And then some proportion of the leaves that do uh, leaf out become infected and, you know, lose their photosynthetic, photosynthetic capacity, you know, that has to have an effect on the carbon budget of the tree. Um, the beech trees and lots of trees have a have a really strong reserve of carbon in their roots and and in their in their stems and so they can weather that storm for a number of seasons and i think they're still doing that um as, as far as we can tell cranking out just enough photosynthate to to survive but it has to weaken them and it and, it, and if, it, if it continues year after year it's sort of it's pretty likely to lead to mortality but at the moment we we're not seeing a ton of especially large trees dying i hope it stays that way certainly puts us in a pickle because there's not a ton we can do. We don't super know the vectors. We don't have a great way to to manage it once it's found. It, are there any, like with Asian longhorn beetle, sometimes they'll like have a demarcation and, you know, manage all the trees in those areas. There hasn't been any delineation. This is not a federally regulated pest, right? Well, uh, yeah, actually I'm not hundred percent sure about regulation. I don't think so. I mean, the, the reality is it's moving so quickly that it's just, trying to think that we're going to quarantine it at this stage, I think is, is pretty unlikely. You know, if, if you recall with, with the Emerald Ash Borer, when it was still in, in Michigan, they tried, they, they cut a massive buffer around Detroit and tried to prevent the escape across that. I think it was a uh, 20 mile buffer or, or more um, uh, where they removed all the ash uh, healthy and, and healthy ash really. Uh, and it, it, the, the, Emerald ash borer still got past the the buffer zone, but once it's in 15 states in Canada, I just don't think you're going to stop it, unfortunately. So, 
we're currently not recommending that anybody do anything really in terms of like salvage cutting their tree. You know, it, 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 I don't think it's necessarily, we don't have the research to say that it's beneficial to cut down an infested tree and it might even have negative effects uh, and there might be recovery. So it might, might be a little bit pre premature to do that. And, um, you know, cutting healthy forests in advance of, of the disease arriving that wouldn't seem to have too much value either. So unfortunately, yeah, you're right. We are in a bit of a pickle. This is a tough one. I mean, I, when I, when I speak to students and, and other folks about these kinds of things where there's not an obvious solution, I, you know, I really try to stress that, you know, prevention is, is the key here. So if we can learn from this and, you know, amend our trade laws in ways that, makes it much less likely that the next beech leaf nematode or emerald ash, ash borer will arrive in our forest, things would be way, way better than trying to scramble for a solution once it's here. Go ahead, David. Um, well, this isn't so much a question about this disease, but just the overall impact on the forest. Um, so, you know, beech is a, is a huge mast uh, species for wildlife in this area. Uh, you know, chestnuts are pretty much gone. They used to be. Um, we're north of a lot of the oak, and their oak has its own issues. D do you have any idea? I mean, if 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 beaches become decimated the way chestnuts were by this, any idea what this is going to do the, to the wildlife situation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have a lot of happy things to say about that. I, I guess my, I, I think it would be devastating, honestly. It, some some species really depend on beach masts uh, to, you know, survive and reproduce. So, you know, bear are particularly dependent on beach. Um, I guess what I'd be hoping for is that mortality and you know serious decline is sporadic enough that there are still enough beach in the forest to provide resources for enough wildlife you know i, I i'm not really willing to to go uh, some people are saying this is the end of beach i i don't think we're there yet mm -hmm. uh, you know there, like i said there's a lot of genetic diversity it's a resilient species um i i, I don't think we can count the species out yet um uh, but if the unfortunate becomes the inevitable, uh, you know, and we do lose a significant proportion of beach. I, I think that's really problematic for, for wildlife. I don't know what will happen. I mean, we, we could consider assisted migration of oak or because there's just nothing to replace it. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question is, is, is there an, an alternative or even if a poor alternative and in the interests of preserving the rest of the ecosystem, are are there things that we should be in particular monitoring? You know, again, not giving up on on beach, but right. you know, yeah. I mean, in terms of like that kind of late fall um, protein source, it well, you know, beach is a in the phagaceae, the same family as the oaks. So the oaks sort of have a somewhat similar ecological role, and they have that mast production uh, in the late season. And so, you know, in terms of like ecological corollaries from the perspective of wildlife and, and protein availability, it, it would probably be oak. You know, if, if it really starts to look bad, I'm I, people are gonna start thinking about, well, they already are thinking about breeding for resistance. So unfortunately that's a slow process. And if you've been following the chestnut saga, one that has a lot of pitfalls, um, but breeding for resistance, Crossbreeding with some of the less susceptible species and and or varieties could could potentially be a, a partial solution. You know, if it becomes dire and you know, deer and bear are are really suffering, we we might think about something more dramatic than we might otherwise. But yeah, I don't know um, what you know that that's that's over, above my pay grade. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Wonderful. We've just got a, a few minutes left. Any last lingering questions? I think I'll hang my hat on what you said about not counting the beach out yet. <laughs> yeah. If anything, yeah, we'll we'll hang I'll hang my hat on that. And and honestly, one of the things that is 
really positive is that we had nearly 30 people here tonight to learn about this. And there are many more that are going to be watching the recording. And we have so many Vermonters that care about the health of our forests that are going to be looking out for beech leaf disease and many other things to look out for. So we are really grateful for the amount of time and energy that folks are putting into this to learn and to maybe look for something before it gets too far along and maybe we'll have different solutions so we appreciate everyone caring so much about their forest so definitely thank you guys and don't be afraid to reach out if you have other questions and, and um yeah or if you um, want to report something that seems of relevance i'm, I'm always happy to hear Wonderful. not necessarily happy but interesting <laughs> to hear. maybe not so happy but appreciate yeah. the information right yeah there we go <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much. We'll post the recording on the um, course uh, webpage. And um, Dr. Garnas, maybe we could ask you for a PDF of those slides just because they had some really great pictures that people might want to take a closer look at too, if that's possible. Sure. I can do that. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Garnas. We really appreciate all the work and attention you're putting towards this pest and pathogen. <laughs> you bet. All okay. right. Thanks, take everybody. care, everybody.